Okay, thanks Alicia, thanks for asking me to come up. Um, Apologise for the state of my voice, I've been a bit crook, but um, we won't get into that too much. Um, I've been bailed up by a couple of people already about this word at the beginning here, called neo archean So what that means is new. And the Archean's divided into three main periods, the neo archean the meso archean and the eo archean So just so you know, that's the, uh, that's the fancy thing that the academics call it these days. So don't worry, late Archean will do just fine. Um, I'd just like to thank my um, co-authors on the paper, um, particularly uh, Dick Tosdell, who's a, um, an American consultant who, um, who cajoled, whipped, and, uh, and beat me over the head to get this paper written. So without his, um, without his help, it wouldn't have happened. So um, that's good. And the paper's in the volume that uh, Alicia's going to give away to some lucky person. Um, OK, so I'm going to start with the conclusion straight away, with the takeaways. Um, there's probably three main things that I want you to remember. Please feel free to leave your phones on. Answer in a loud voice if you're fine, that's okay. Um, tell your mum to put your dinner in the oven, that's fine. Um, so um, number one is that um, neo-Archean geology, and I'm talking about rocks that are less than about 27, 20 million years old to about 2650 or so. Um, is almost identical across, across the planet in terms of the stratigraphy, the structure and the gold mineralisation and then the structure of those, um, those greenstone belts. So they've generally got some lower part of mafic and ultramafic volcanism, sometimes not ultramafic, uh, felsic and intermediate volcanism and then upper units of coarse clastic sedimentary rocks. It's a very common theme and I'll, I'll show you how that goes. The late stage rocks are deposited above unconformities that overprint deformed older rocks. In the eastern gold fields, um, the belts are showing evidence for um, what looks like multiple rifting cycles. And we can interpret that by age groups of these, um, of these greenstone belts, and, um, or remnants of these greenstone belts. And, um, and that means that we've got younger greenstones that have been emplaced upon older greenstones. And, um, and sometimes even older greenstones as well. And that tells us that we've got some early structure in the belt. Um, one of the things I probably am going to emphasise over the next 40 minutes or so is that um, what, we, what we end up when we go out in the field and when we look at the maps and we look at the aeromagnetics, we see a lot of penetrative strain, a lot of deformation that, um, that hits the belts. And this kind of overwhelms everything you look at. You go into the field and you see a tonne of foliation uh, lots of faults and shear zones and all that kind of thing. Um, and if we, if we pay a little bit of attention to the stratigraphy underneath that, we can see that there's actually some, some early stage structure which ends up being important for gold. Um, and so major gold belts are associated with these um, syn and post-volcanic structures that are primarily related to the formation and deformation of the greenstone belts. When you look at the distribution of gold deposits, you don't see a very much coincidence between these major terrain boundary faults. There's no, no lines and lines of gold deposits lying along um, what are understood and researched to be the, um, the main terrain boundary faults. That's an interesting thing to look at as well. Um, okay, so when you, um, when, you give a, when you give a talk, the boffins say, if everybody walks away and remembers one thing, um, you've been a really good communicator and you've done well. So I've got three things for you, but if you just remember this last one, that would be the one to take away. Um, that there were multiple stages of mineralisation and alteration. And um, the early stage gold uh, mineralisation, and sometimes just alteration, um, uh, is associated with unconformities below the youngest volcanic sequences, certainly in this district um, and elsewhere. And that also suggests this fundamental synvolcanic architecture that has been completely wiped out, almost completely wiped out, by the, uh, the late stage penetrative strain. Okay? Um, now the really key thing there is that those old faults uh, get hit and reactivated again and again. And they provide a focus area for the young syn and post metamorphic um, deformation zones, the orogenic deposits that we know and love and that um, pay all our mortgages for us. Okay? Um, and mostly are quartz carbonate vein deposits. 
So when, when I say syn volcanic um, for base metal type mineralization, that's nickel, nickel deposits, uh, you know, some proper um, copper lead zinc type, not many here, but elsewhere. Um, I'm talking about syn volcanic with respect to commodiite and the earliest stages of black fag mineralization. Okay. For gold, I'm talking about syn volcanic with the latest stages of black flag felsic volcanism. And I'll show you what that looks like. Okay. So greenstone belts uh, around the world are um, uh, in the most productive Neoarchean terrains. Uh, the Abitibi in the uh, Superior Province of Canada, the Lake Victoria gold fields in the East Congo Craton of, um, of Africa, Tanzania, and of course the Eastern Gold Fields Province of, of the Yilgarn. Um, I don't want to dwell too long on this, but these are, are you know, granite greenstone terrains comprised of you know, volcanic sedimentary uh, rocks with lots and lots of mostly granite uh, that are in the belt, all the pink things. And, um, and long linear belts of, um, of gold deposits, long linear trends of gold deposits, and transcrustal steel structures. They would be the, the key, um, the key uh, points about that. Okay, so I just want to review those really quickly, just a slide each, and um, I'll just quickly talk about them. So in the Abitibi of Canada, here's the map. Um, they've got two main breaks, the Porcupine Desta Fault up the top, and the Lada Lake Cadillac break in the bottom. Um, in this case, a lot of the gold deposits sit on those two breaks. Um, the situation is slightly different in Canada, but I don't want to go into too much detail. Um, and you can see from the little uh, time space map here or time event map that there's quite a lot of non-gold mineralization that happens early in the piece. So we've got cyclic volcanism in through here, um, and then we've got uh, some intermediate to felsic uh, sedimentation and volcanism um, in the middle above an unconformity, and then a late stage epiclastic sedimentary unconformity on top. That's the Tomiskaming formation of Canada. And that's all those little blue blips all the way through here. And, and we, what we see is all the way down the Lada Lake Cadillac break and down the Porcupine Desta Fault that the gold camps are associated spatially with these um, little remnants of the youngest stratigraphy. And um, so here's some, some really nice uh, stringer zone from the La Ronde uh, massive sulphide. You can see that's not a happy stringer, that's been deformed and flattened. It's quite a, quite a strong tectonic fabric going this way. And, and to go with that is uh, a little bit further down the road at Bousquet, the, um, we've got andalusite alteration that is also deformed and flattened. And the andalusite is um, metamorphosed syn volcanic, probably after sericite pyrite, something like that. Um, and then also, we, you know, the later phase of that, we get the nice, the beautiful sigma vein, laminated shear vein, we know these well, iron carbonate alteration, and, um, and the same thing up around Rouen here, a nice shear zone, a bunch of flat veins in the, in the wall rock like that. And so those, those, uh, these veins over here fit into the synergenic category. Um, these VMS type deposits, and they are proper base metal VMS, fit into the, the earlier phases through here. And you get a little bit of gold rich VMS uh, here and there as well. You know, just a lazy 11 million ounces or something like that at the, um, at the Horn. Um, in the Lake Victoria gold fields in East Africa, a similar story stratigraphically. Uh, the lower and upper Nyanzian separated by an unconformity. The, um, you know, mafic and felsic volcanics in the lower parts, felsic and intermediate volcanics in the middle part, and then the Cavarondian unconformity up and through here. And, um, you know, the, uh, the Cavarondian looks identical to the Tamiskaming, looks identical to the Marugal, to identical to the Karawang. Um, we see it's a similar story in these belts uh, all the way through. Uh, where's Bullion Hulu? Bullion's down here. Um, and um, North Mara's up through here. So Bullion Hulu, you can see uh, boudinized quartz chalcopyrite veins. So significant deformation post-dating the emplacement of those veins. They're early, they've been deformed. And the beautiful photo by my good friend, the late Pete Sporer here um, from North Mara. Um, that's gold, so that's copper, that's co chalcopyrite, but this is gold. And you can see these um, early deformed veins in through there. So, um, <coughs> excuse me, again, a similar kind of story, early mineralization that's been deformed, a similar structure to the greenstone belt. Um, and at the end of it all, everything is uplifted and there's a sedimentary 
uh, sequence deposited on top. Uh, for the eastern gold fields, um, a similar story again. Um, whoops. So, uh, so this is the, the, the terrain map, if you like. The brown things are the, the late clastic sedimentary rocks. And we've got these major gold camps, um, Leonora, Laverton, Kalgoorlie, Cambelda, uh, probably Jundee, Waluna, if you like. And um, a spatial association of the thickest parts of the greenstones. Also in those thickest parts of the greenstones, we get thick sequences of the younger stratigraphy as well, um, where the major gold camps are turning up. And we've got a similar uh, story with our stratigraphy. So we've got, um, we've got a bunch of uh, some very old stratigraphy down the, um, so this is the age on the side of the graph here. It's a very old stratigraphy down the bottom, it's um, Norseman. A sequence from sort of 2795 to 2770 old stratigraphy uh, in each of these belts that are turning up. I'll tell you about those in a minute. And then, you know, the bulk of what we understand is the, um, the, the, the main, I guess, um, certainly where the most of the gold deposits are. Um, the main stratigraphic package, which the equivalent would be the Cambelda, uh, Cambelda Kalgoorlie sequence, um, best known in through here, of course, it's got a nice stratigraphic column. Um, lower mafic and ultramafic, middle, intermediate and felsic volcanic, and then a major unconformity at the top of that with the, the late basins or the late plastic sedimentary rocks. Notable that over at uh, Sunrise Dam, when everything's going ultramafic and mafic over in these terrains, it's, uh, it's intermediate volcanism uh, over there at the same age. Okay, so, um, <coughs> so one thing we do see which is also common. This is just a quick summary diagram of those, those stratigraphic columns. And, um, and what we actually do see is evidence for those early mineralization phases that are included in the late stage uh, clastic rocks, which is very, very interesting. <clears throat> Clasts of gold bearing pebbles in the, um, in the upper Nyanzian, up at uh, Gakona, fragments of very epithermal looking, very gold rich um, porphyry in the foot wall of Canana Bell. And again, and also in the, um, uh, in the, the Caverondian over in, um, <coughs> excuse me, over in Canada. Um, and so, so basically to, to put that into some sort of quick summary of, of what those styles would be, um, we've got like a, there's, there are early phases that are predating that main orogenic shortening and deformation event and metamorphism, <coughs> excuse me. And, um, and some of these are, are intrusion related. Um, most, uh, a lot of them are associated with high level intrusions that were probably feeding um, some of the youngest volcanic stratigraphy. Um, so Fimiston Jundee, Canana and Malarctic and Kirkland Lake would be very good examples of those. Um, they're associated with uh, high potassium porphyries, unconformities. Um, they've got a very st specific sort of uh, high level style. We don't want to go using that epi word, but, um, but that's uh, sometimes a little hard to escape. Um, quite often uh, represented by some evidence for oxidized fluids, either in um, the iron rich phases or uh, quite often a lot of anhydrite and things like that with the, uh, with the ore. And many of them are overprinted. Um, and um, and then, of course, the late phase synorogenic um, uh, quartz carbonate vein deposits hosted in shear zones, fault fill veins, as I say, that we know and love in brittle ductile shear zones um, that are related to laminated shear veins, low angle extensional veins, the classic uh, synorogenic veins at green schist facies condition. And so it's the, the juxtaposition of those two styles, which is where it all gets confusing. And um, don't let anyone trick you. You know, Archean low gold deposits are tough. Structurally, they're tough. They can be very complicated. If anybody's ever been to, say, somewhere like Argo, or gosh, even some of the deposits up around Mount Morgans, you go in those pits and it's structural chaos, you know? And um, so we, we, we shouldn't feel bad if we, uh, if we get in there and go, wow, what the hell's going on? And start scratching our heads, you know? But what, what we've got is this early phase of mineralization that gets uh, overprinted by the deformation, okay? And so it's very common to see areas like this where we've got evidence for that higher level uh, mineralization that's then 
cut by their nice typical orogenic style deposits. And I'll show you a few examples uh, of that as we go on. And so the, the, you know, conceptually, we would see those as being associated. These are all the gold deposit clans that we can, <coughs> excuse me, we can find around the world. Uh, we see these higher, higher level styles. So this is, you know, gold rich VMS on the seafloor. Well, no problem with that at all. That's, that's the, uh, the horn deposit up in, um, up in Rwanda, Naranda, up in Canada, overprinted by orogenic vein systems, okay? So the horn started up here and was buried and overprinted by orogenic phase mineralization and now has been returned back up to surface like that. So, um, so this is, this is a, com a fairly common theme. I don't think I'm, you know, I'm not stretching the bounds of credibility here or saying anything that, that is not uh, understood by Archean workers all over the planet, okay? Okay, so that was point number one. Now, um, the second phase I want to talk about is uh, the cycles of greenstone volcanism. And, um, and I want to focus back in on the eastern gold fields, if we can. And again, as I say, uh, the Penny Shore Formation, 2930, we're into the Mesoarchean here. And, um, and uh, you know, uh, remnants of older stratigraphy in sort of 2798 to 2720 in certain places throughout the belt that we've got some reliable ages for, right? Now, it's quite possible that there's a lot more of these around and we don't really know about them. But what we can be, can suspect and can be quite um, confident of is that when we find these things, they're telling us that we're getting close to the boundaries of, a, of some kind of uh, basin margin fault, you know? It's not gonna look like it did when it formed. It's gonna be squashed and turned over, but it's gonna be close by. And if those, if those kinds of structures were uh, facilitating fluid flow, facilitating the right kind of magmas to come up um, from the mantle, perhaps, then, um, then we're getting close to the area where we need to be for, for the, the right kinds of gold deposits. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so the, the way I would picture this in my head is that there are preserved as like football horses, and I'll just go a couple of slides over. So if I just, this is just a nice empirical little data set here. Um, it's just a um, age analysis, um, you know, shrimp age analyses from, from the government work, from industry, from um, academic work, for all these, all these rocks over the, over the gold fields compiled into 50 million year bins. <coughs> and, um, and what we find, the ones that I've got a, a red blob around, are the oldest ones. These are all pre-2700, maybe a little bit older than 2750, uh, 2796, 2684, 2803, 2760, and so on. And the thing to note about them is that they're all sitting around the edges of the youngest greenstones. So this big belt in the middle through here, 2700 to 2650, the green stuff, all the old, old ages are sitting around the edges of that. And that's really instructive when you look at the map pattern. Now, like I said, you've got to got to kind of look back through the deformation. So everything here is squashed. There's a very significant north-northwest uh, fabric. The, the intrusions are elongate. The folds go that way as well. Everything's squashed out like that. So whatever architecture was there before has been modified significantly, okay? And all we're getting at is a hint of it in the distribution of the ages through there like that. Um, and so for me, this, pre this suggests a pre kalgoorlie terrain greenstone architecture. Um, and we see it in a few other data sets as well. And um, so, so here's a really nice old paper from the GSWA done by a guy called Horowitz back in 1967, who just, once, once a lot of the mapping had been done back then, he just said, oh, I just see, sometimes I see conglomerates, sometimes I see coarse clustic rocks. I want to see where they are. And so he plotted them up. And that's all the little blue circles in through here. And basically they form a, a trend of the youngest coarse clastic sequences that go straight across that fabric. So remember, all the tectonic fabric goes this way. Really strong fabric, elongate plutons, fold axes, all that stuff. But the, uh, the youngest parts of the stratigraphy are in a belt that trends almost straight across that at, a, at an angle. If you uh, pull out a couple of other data sets like the regional gravity, then you can see there are some remarkable northeast trending breaks. Um, if you then throw up some of the early stage mineralization, base metal and nickel, we're getting some trends that are sitting along, along those types of structures. 
If anyone's ever been for a wander around the Cambelda Dome, uh, you see this beautiful set of east-west, not quite east-west, east-northeast sort of trending dikes that are cutting straight across through that area. Um, for golf fields, Karen, a lady called Karen Connors years ago did a really great study on uh, the Cambelda district and, um, and was trying to understand what, what all this, why we've got all these blocks of, um, of high gravity that have got these major edges that are going off to the northeast and effectively um, the, you know, to, to then forward model the gravity and see what we're looking at. We're looking at basement scale structures that are actually trending off up this way. Now again, when you look at the fabrics on the surface, the D3 fabrics, the late stage deformation, that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. Right? <coughs> but um, when we think of base metal and nickel deposits, so a commoditeite, commoditeite nickel copper PGE deposit is a syn volcanic mineralized, uh, min mineral deposit. Um, and um, they're thermal erosion channels, they're coming out of the vent, and so when you're next to one of those things, you're next to a vent, so they're vent proximal. And, um, the, uh, and so basically, I, I'm not suggesting that those were the orientations of the vents, but as we know in extensional terrains, you can have faults in a, a range of orientations, some of which will be parallel to the rift, some of which will be transverse to the rift, some of which will be perpendicular to the rift. Um, okay. So it predates the penetrative strain that we see in the gold fields. So if we now just step out a little bit, um, or come back to the geological map actually, and these red circles now are showing you the areas of pre-2750 greenstone that are preserved. So the pale green colours, this is the Penny Shore and the Naganya formations up around Norseman through there. Uh, there's another big slab of it up through here in Leonora. Um, and up uh, around Laverton, sitting right on the edges of, of the basin. And then all of these greenstones in the middle here are significantly younger than that. Now Quentin is here tonight and one of his uh, mafia buddies are going around madly trying to find more of these things because uh, with the CET, they're, um, and they're, they're, they're hot on the trail, which is really good. Um, because what this is gonna do is, is put, put together for us Rather than we just we get all, all bamboozled by the late deformation, we're going to start to pull together a whole other architecture that's buried in the map here, you know, which is really good. And that's going to lead to targeting. Um, so in terms of intrusions, the, uh, this is the intrusion map from the, <coughs> excuse me, the Amira project. Um, the Mafic uh, low uh, large iron lithophile element subgroup was you know, found back in 2002 to have a common spatial association with gold deposits. Um, so in the Kalgoorlie terrain, these red blobs in through here, that's the Mafic group. Um, the orange blobs in through here are the uh, high field strength elements group and the pink ones are the cyanites. And so um, we certainly got a, an association with these Mafic series intrusions in the, um, uh, in the Kalgoorlie terrain and with some slightly different, more alkalic intrusions over in the, the eastern terrains. That's great. But um, so that, that's, that's good stuff, and, and we, that's how we understand the distribution of the granites. Um, Hugh Smithies at the moment is running around madly um, uh, dating, which is fantastic, dating uh, lots of rocks, and, um, and also uh, analysing the chemistry of these intrusions. And, um, and Hugh's got a couple of really good publications out on Sanukatoids. Um, these are felsic magmas believed to be directly extracted from a mantle source. So if you want to get some gold from somewhere, remember there's, um, there's always been a lot of different models, where does the gold come from, all that sort of jazz, and um, you can come up with three or four different ways to do it, <coughs> some more convincing than others. Um, uh, getting gold from the mantle is a quick and dirty way to do it, um, especially given that all across the world at this time, um, gold, the mantle was leaking gold at a, at a huge rate of knots, you know, in all of those neo-Archean terrains, certainly the productive ones anyway. Um, and so these are metasomatized mantles, um, possibly uh, so that by, metasomatized by trace element rich fluids and melts, possibly including gold. There's a guy in Canada called Gary Beekhouse who's got a study that says that some of these diuretic intrusions are actually do have an enrichment in gold, and that's a potential source in the, um, uh, in the rocks as well. And, um, and they're inherently hydrous. And so when we, when we want to generate large volumes of hydrothermal fluid, we need um, hydrous magmas. So certainly that works in the Phanerozoic space in porphyry systems. Um, 
hydrous oxidised fluids um, are coming, coming off uh, high level intrusions. Um, okay. So now I'll just give you a quick, am I going for time, Alicia? Yep, okay. Um, I've just got a, um, more photos than you can poke a stick at of gold deposits over the gold fields, which is fun. We all want to look at some rocks. Um, so these are the main categories of gold deposit styles that we, um, that we find in the eastern gold fields. Okay? I don't think I've left many out, but um, I, I left out the ones in granite, but they're just, you know, you're good old orogenic vein deposits, so we don't need to, to get too upset about whether they're in granite or not. Um, but uh, quartz carbonate, massive and laminated vein and stockwork. Okay, that's, the, that's the, the bread and butter of everybody in this room, okay? And, um, and this town for the last 100 plus years. Sulfidic replacements in banded iron formation. Again, an iron rich rock, a reduced fluid, sulfur rich fluid comes in, iron and sulfur get together to make pyrite, destabilize gold, and we get a gold deposit. Um, then we get these other kind of slightly, <coughs> slightly enigmatic ones. Um, sulfidic replacements and crustiform carbonate veins and breccia, and we'll have a look at some of those. Uh, there's a few, a few funny ones like um, intrusion hosted vein and stockwork. Um, no, tell, tell her we'll be finished in about half an hour, mate. Um, and um, and so Canada Bell's a really good example of that, um, uh, and Granny Smith as well. So vein and stockwork in in. Uh, in intrusive, intrusive rocks, not in basement granites as such. So the ones I was thinking about that I'm not mentioning are things like the Golden Cities deposit. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, these are in high level hyperbyssal intrusions. Sulfide rich veins um, and sulfide only loads at Fimiston. And, um, and then some really weird ones like disseminated and veinlet gold. Very strange looking deposits that are just gold and, uh, and not much alteration and not much else. And um, and one scale deposit, if you like. Maybe, maybe there's more. Sorry, Andreas. Okay, so the quartz carbonate, massive and laminated veins, we all know what they look like. Paradigm, um, Kandana, the junction deposit at Kandana, and, uh, you know, hidden secret. Over at the Golden Mile. Um, let me go back. So, Massive and laminated components, so shear veining on the contact through here. More massive components in through here. These are multi-stage opening, cracking and shearing. So quartz is being precipitated into, into these shear zones as they're moving. You can see, sorry, you can see the, um, the preservation of a little sliver of what used to be in the wall rock at, um, at Rally here, right? So here's all these wing veins that would have been poking out into the wall rock through there. And we've just captured a little bit of that. And now you've got this beautiful ductile uh, laminated shear vein uh, enclosing that and protecting it, and and you know this that that description or that little diagram I had before, where you've got a, a shear host of vein and a bunch of flats coming off it, that is the style of of this um, this type of system. Breccia, sigmoidal um, shear veins um, at junction, <clears throat> uh, and then uh, flat sheeted vein arrays. These are pretty common as well, and um, re usually associated with reverse faults. So Darlow in through there, um, Mount Charlotte, beautiful sheet of vein with a little component of stock work, nice taper veins, so the tapers always tell us which way things got squashed. We know the extension was that way, um, the, the compression was from the sides, um, exquisite stock works at, um, at Hidden Secret. And, and now we get to some of these weird ones. Okay, so here's Jundee, uh, crustiform, carbonate, Crustiform, roscolite, telluride, carbonate, uh, quartz veins. Yeah, really interesting. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, Sunrise Dam, again, lots of crustiform veins, uh, quite often deformed. This particular one isn't very deformed. If you get into the right orientation at Jundee, you find some that are significantly deformed, which is uh, interesting as well. Wallabies are a different, slightly different case. Probably a, a really good solid orogenic deposit, I think. The um, uh, mostly, mostly quartz fill, lots of carbonate alteration there. You can see this, all this pale colour in the wallaby conglomerate. There's the clasts in the conglomerate. <coughs> Excuse me, that's, um, that's ferron, dolomite and anchorite. And, um, and these, are, these are flat loads that have been imposed upon a, a brittle uh, host rock. You know? so, um, so slightly different uh, scenario to Sunrise and, um, and Jundee. 
And um, here's a couple of good ones. This is my favorite. This is one of Louis Gautier's photos, one of my favorite Femiston photos where you can see a very strong uh, ductile crenulation cleavage even overprinting the alteration assemblage around a crustiform vein uh, network in um, and you know this little thing through here would have been a wing vein poking out into the rocks now it's been completely flattened and um, lots of disseminated sulfides. Uh, gold tellurium and anhydrite or tellurides and anhydrite in a, in a beautiful little vein with a pale green um, vanadium rich mica alteration in the background there's the, there's the blue stain from carbonate staining. That's, um, that rock usually looks like that, but when you stain it up, it, um, it comes out this pale blue color, which is mostly anchorite and ferron dolomite. And then the weirdos. So this is a crusader from one of um, Nick Tabo's papers, just disseminated gold, and of course, wattle dam, which is absolutely obscene. Um, and wouldn't we like some more wattle dam, right? Anyway. Um, some sulphide replacement of Binduli, so we've got a, an early, <coughs> excuse me, an early phase uh, tuffaceous mudstone, so pretty, pretty fine scale photomicrograph here. There's little crystals of feldspar that make up the mudstone, and you can see all the sulphides are replacing the matrix of the mudstone. So that's an early phase sulphide replacement uh, in the middle of that mudstone. And then, uh, as I described for, for banded iron formation, this is sunrise again, excuse me, um, magnetite iron formation. Uh, replaced, iron rich rock replaced by, replaced by sulphides. Um, and I guess finally, Canana Bell, um, stock work in a porphyry. So a very irregular stock work of, of carbonate and um, a little quartz and silica. Um, very pale albite alteration over the top there. With a disseminated population of sulphides that are elongating the foliation. You can see this is one of Brett Davis's photos. So we'll have to, um, have to put his name on that before you send this out, Alicia. Um, this is um, an early phase uh, inclusion rich core. This is what causes all the mess with the roaster. And then these clean um, arsenic rich overgrowths and um, gold and chalcopyrite and some other things in the precious shadows. So pyrites that were in the rock prior to the imposition of the deformation. So, and we can also see uh, some later phase. So there's the stock work. We've got little fragments in a, a very high grade um, uh, telluride gold crustiform uh, brexture in through here. Very, you know, very brittle style. Um, you can see this um, sort of cockade overgrowth of the clasts with the, um, the tellurides and also chock a block full of, of blue carbonate, iron carbonate. Um, so, so that's a whole bunch of different, different things that we see over the gold fields, and it's a, it's a bit of a snapshot, really. Um, you, we, uh, we could put together a much more comprehensive um, list and, and bunch of photos of that, and which would be a really great thing to do, Alicia. And um, so, uh, so the distribution of those mineralization styles, quartz carbonate vein and stock work is the most common, no doubt about it. Everybody knows that. Um, and they're hosted in and adjacent to these ubiquitous D3 shear zones. Um, so most of that penetrative deformation, penetrative fabric, is nearly always almost parallel to the, the major shear zones that cut through it. It's a strain localization uh, issue. And, um, and then you get, of course, gold in the slightly later uh, faults and fracture networks. But they're all kind of kinematically doing the same thing. You know, there's no, um, there's no, no real, real need to, to, to put a big brick wall between them. Um, <clears throat> so in most, in most of those examples, the, um, the veins in the stockworks are hosted by iron-rich tholeitic mafic rocks and, uh, and, and <coughs> excuse me, iron-rich intrusive sills, like the golden mile dolerite, for instance, the condenser dolerite. But, you know, how many dolerites have you got out of KCGM, just enter, you know, as many as you want. Um, sulfidic replacements in crust are, um, uh, are less common, um, but they're observed as early stage pre-deformation components. Now, that doesn't ref that's not reflected in the endowment, right? So when I went back to my first slide there with the, the three greenstone terrains and the eastern gold field's got 225 million ounces of gold. Well, nearly half of that sits within a 50K radius of Kalgoorlie. And nearly 60% of that sits in one place. Okay, so it's a very uneven endowment distribution. And that's primarily by virtue of the fact that the, um, the Femiston sulfidic replacement loads, generally without very much quartz, 
are, account for a bulk of that endowment. <clears throat> so even though we see more of these, um, the potential for a world-class system is certainly sitting in um, this earlier stuff. And the other, the other things are fairly limited in their development. Like I said, there's one scan that we can be fairly sure of, and um, you know, and those little gold-only things are, are a little, um, a little enigmatic, and there's not many of those either. Okay, um, in terms of structural control, um, everybody knows that gold deposits in the Archean are structurally controlled, and um, and that's great, and. Um, that means that all you people in this room need to get some skills in structural geology if you're going to go looking for them. You don't have to be an expert. You haven't got to be able to deal with polyphase deformation. But um, certainly understanding the geometry, how to make a map and a cross section, good stuff to know. And, um, and so the, you know, they, these things occur in um, little, little perturbations such as strike and dip changes, fault jogs, uh, you know, areas that allow the fluid flow to be enhanced. Okay. So, for instance, up at quarters here, we've got a, a layered sequence of mafic rocks um, that are dipping that way, that are cut at a high angle by a gold-bearing fault. And so, they're tholeitic, uh, iron-rich tholeites. Gold loves iron-rich tholeites. It's going to be mineralized to some extent. But what we see is that there are uh, textual characteristics that you can log in drill core. Uh, you can see coarse-grained basalt, fine-grained pillow basalt, uh, non-pillowed basalt and, and more fine-grained pillow basalt. And so where that fault cuts through that layering, it's all ore, okay? So all of these contours are all, you know, above five grams per tonne. But the really high-grade stuff is sitting in the fine-grained pillowed units. So there is a characteristic, a physical, rheological uh, and structural control in that, um, in that geometry and that uh, layering in the rock is an important thing to pay attention to when you're in a, in a deposit and when you're logging, you know? Um, the other point on this slide I really wanted to emphasise is that the long axis of these systems is some version of that. It's never that, right? We don't see a lot of honest to goodness strike slip. In the latest phases of deformation in the gold fields, there is strike slip, no doubt about it. In the faults, late stage faults, uh, black flag fault, shamrock fault, they've all got a little bit of that, okay? But these orogenic deposits are formed in the orogenic phase of deformation. That means when everything's uh, being, you know, everything's being, uh, the extension's over, the granites have stopped coming in and now everything's being, being squashed at a high angle. That means upright faults and thrusts, upright folds, upright foliations, and here's Sons of Gualia going down to two kilometres. I don't know, anybody from SOGS here? Know how deep it is now? I think it's over two k's now. Here's the, uh, the two trends on the Kandana camp and you can see very, very strong um, downward plunges. So this, this is important as explorers and miners because it means that you need to keep going that way. Right? And, um, and when you hit, you put a hole in underneath, it's not that good, you can say to your boss, but hang on. And, and so I've got two examples for you there. I've been collecting these long sections from all over the world. I can show you about 50, right? And they're all doing the same thing in our terrains, right? So, um, so we don't want to be stopping things here. Okay, unless the geotech gets really bad as it does, that's problem belong engineer, okay? We, we, we just want to know where the gold is. All right. Um, for greenstone gold alteration, um, the, the, the kinds of minerals that we see and that we need to worry about um, predominantly reflect wall rock composition and, um, and proximity to intrusion. We can infer depth of formation and sometimes temperature of the system, okay? Um, and so things, when we get amphibole, biotite, magnetite, and calcite, um, we generally are considering that we're dealing with higher temperature uh, mineralization, right? Higher temperature systems, so I guess something like Big Bell, for instance, would be a good, or the, the, probably one of the type examples of that. And there's a few of them around, and they're, and they're generally on the margins of the greenstone belt, away from the, the green schist facies central portions of the thick greenstones. And then when we get to the centre of the belts, like we do in Kalgoorlie, we get these lower temperature characteristic green schist facies. White mica, anchorite, pyrite, arsenopyrite. Um, going outwards to chlorite, calcite. Okay, so, so this, is, um, this is anchorite and uh, ferron dolomite, a little bit of pink calcite there. There's the brown stain. Everybody knows what happens to dolerite when you leave the, the, 
the top tray out in the sun, it looks like that. And when you stain it, it goes blue with all that anchorite. Um, but what we're finding more and more now, um, and I guess I don't, think, I don't think it's grown out of here, out of greenstone work, but it's probably grown out of epithermal work, is to pay attention to the white mica chemistry. And so Canonabell is probably one of the, the predominant um, uh, demonstrations of that where when you look at the, these are just uh, bottom of hole rab chips where we've gone and taken a PEMA analysis or a, a white mica ASD analysis. And, um, and right at the location of five million ounces of gold, there's a gradient from muscovitic and paragonitic white mica to higher temperature fengitic compositions. And I mean, Scott Halley could tell you why that's important. I can't. But as an explorer, I know it's important because that's a gradient. And five million ounces sits right on the gradient. So I want to go find more of that. You know? that's, uh, that's the way we want, to, we want to kind of use this sort of thing. Um, okay, so, so this, is, um, this is a slightly updated map of the Kalgoorlie district. And um, as I said before, 100 million ounces of gold, eight mining camps in a 50k radius, uh, which is almost half of the eastern goldfields gold endowment. So something very special was happening here. Uh, those are the camps and their rough endowments. Um, and what we find in the Kalgoorlie district is a, a regional spatial association um, with these late clastic rocks. And that's this, that's this sort of uh, pale, pale browny, orangey colour through here. So that's the Currawang Formation, uh, Pangalo Conglomerate, Marugal Formation, and the Penny Dam Conglomerate. So in that district, there's a lot of that younger than 2650 aged sedimentary material, cross bedded, quartz rich sandstones, polymictic conglomerates, um, uh, sitting above angular unconformities on folded rocks. Okay. <clears throat> When we go down and drill a little bit deeper, um, we've got a second unconformity un down through here, and that's the orange stuff. Then through here, um, where we've got, uh, so the Binduli, certainly right next to the Golden Mile, in the pit at Canana Bell, um, an, an earlier unconformity in the middle of the Black Flag Group. And so, so if you were going to use this as a, a targeting criterion, you'd say, where, is, where are the thickest, youngest sedimentary rocks? That sounds like a good place for me because it, just, it most simply indicates preservation of stratigraphy. So if anybody is familiar with this area up through here, I hope there's nobody from Bardock Gold here. I'm not, I'm not going to slug off your project, I promise. But um, you, know, you ain't got much up there, right? And um, <laughs> in terms of stratigraphy. And so if, if all of these early mineralization styles, high level intrusion phases, are what we want to see in the biggest gold deposits, then we're going to find it where a bulk of the stratigraphy has been preserved. Up in through here, it's been jammed in between two batholiths. There's only a little bit of the lowest stratigraphy left. You know? Sorry, Brad. Anyway, so, um, uh, OK. <clears throat> so I'll give you three examples of that real quick. And you've seen them all before. Any, anybody who's been to one of these talks before has probably seen them. Um, so, just to preface that, the major gold deposits, um, they've got evidence of multiple gold events. Um, the late orogenic phase, as I've said, is a fairly straightforward affair. It happens at about 26, 40 million years. Noreen Vilreicher did a whole bunch of ages uh, and proved that really nicely on direct dating of all components, hydrothermal phosphates. It's got a very typical orogenic signal. If you like, gold, arsenic, bismuth, a little bit of base metals, tellurium, antimony, tungsten. But the world-class deposits that we see in this district and that's why I like to use Kalgoorlie because it's got the most gold, and it's the best studied, and it's got the most pits and the most drill holes, and you know, hopefully we can apply this elsewhere. Um, but um, that early phase is overprinted by the orogenic phase at the Golden Mile, at Canana Bell, and also at Binduli, which isn't world class, but you never know. You've still got time, Norton Goldfields. So, um, so the interpretation would be that the, um, the early phase mineralisation is associated with synvolcanic faults at around 2660 million years. Okay, and I, I haven't demonstrated that to you yet. I'll show you how, how that works in a sec. Um, and that those faults persisted during during later orogenic events because these mineralisation styles in the best gold deposits keep turning up in the same place. So we've got to kind of try and understand that. Okay, so Binduli. Now Binduli's got a, a slightly, slightly funny elemental smell. Uh, bismuth, tellurium, zinc, that's okay. Molly, uh, mercury in the early phase. So I showed you a photograph of the 
sulfide replacement style before, this is what you get out of it. The late stage taper veins that overprint that are just simply gold arsenic veins. And so in, this is the Centurion pit at, uh, at Binduli. There's the Currawang unconformity, all this blue and grey uh, material here. And, um, and that earlier phase unconformity is just this, uh, this little blue line through here, the Gigi Lake unconformity. And this unit through here is this unit we call a porphyry conglomerate, Binduli porphyry conglomerate. You can see that it sits with unconformity on top of this very high grade sulphide replaced uh, mineralization that also has some felsic volcanics associated with it as well. And it cuts the Centurion porphyry. So we've got a nice age on the Centurion porphyry, therefore we can get a minimum age on the, um, on the maximum depositional age on the, the porphyry conglomerate and through there. There's a whole range of low angle, low grade, very low grade veins. So I've just got red blobs here, but that are associated with the Centurion fault through here. This is a reverse fault, a D3 shear zone. And there's a whole bunch of these flat veins. And this is the, the bulk of the ore at Navajo. Some of the Ben-Hur pits. There's a bunch of pits that sit on the edge of the Currawang formation up through here. And we get these flat veins. So th this is the, the three ppm gold contour in, um, in red. And we get these little wisps of this early phase mineralization just hanging around in through here in the best deposit in the camp. OK. I know it's not world class. Uh, so if we try and put that into a little time sequence, then um, We've got this pre currawang right? Currawang's all the way over here somewhere. Um, pre currawang synvolcanic disseminated sulphide replacement style, okay? Um, intruded by the Binduli porphyry, uplift and erosion, and inclusion of both that mineralization and those porphyry fragments into a polymictic conglomerate, okay? With little remnants of the mudstone, uh, mineralized mudstone in there. So you can take a sample of this basement replace mudstone, you can take little pieces of those uh, pebbles out of the rock, which we've done, and they've got the same, same element, elemental signature, same chemistry. Um, so it's, it's the same stuff. Uh, a major folding event overprints that. Everything's uplifted and eroded, and the Currawang formation is deposited on top of that. And then the major D3 penetrative fabric happens. Because when we look at the Currawang, it's a, it's a polymicic conglomerate, it's flattened and it's got a very, very strong cleavage in it. But the Currawang conglomerate sits with angular unconformity on top of F2 folded rocks. So we know that everything had to be folded, planed off, the Currawang was deposited, and then everything got buried and squashed and the penetrative northwest fabric came down on top of it. It's a really, really important part of the world to understand that relationship between, um, between the folding and, um, and the early mineralization styles and the late stage penetrative fabric. If you go, okay, it depends, right? Structural geologists have got a lot to answer for in this town, I've got to tell you, all right? If you go all the way around the gold fields, you're going to find, um, in nearly every outcrop, you're going to find a strong cleavage in the right kind of rocks, okay? We know that in the middle of crystalline intrusions, uh, we don't develop strain as readily as we do in, say, a conglomerate where you've got an inbuilt rheologic contrast. So you've got a, a hard pebble and a soft matrix, it's gonna take up strain immediately, right? Um, so strain is heterogeneously distributed, but you can map it all across the district and you can pretty much get the same orientation, the same, um, same fabric all the way through, right? So um, if you're a structural geologist and you get paid by the deformation event, then you're gonna, you're gonna wanna turn that into five deformation events, okay? Guaranteed. But I'm not one of those guys. So I, I, won't, uh, I, won't, <laughs> I won't twist your brain with that stuff. Okay, Canada Bell is another example of um, where I showed you the stockwork quartz carbonate sulfide veinlets with disseminated pyrite and gold rich telluride rich, um, gold telluride uh, rich crustiform carbonate and breccia. These phases of mineralization are deformed, right? Um, and I haven't really given you a good example of that deformation other than the, uh, the photomicrograph, but Brett Davis is given me some uh, slides that I put in previous presentations where you can see beautiful folds in the, um, in the crustiform veins. Both of these ore stages are folded and overprinted by the penetrative northwest cleavage, right? There it is there, That's all those, those little lines through there. And then later, cross-cut by Red Hill flat orogenic style taper veins, okay? So again, an early phase of mineralization. So here's the Fitzroy fault comes down through here, 
Uh, Kanana Bell sits right there. There's the football, the hanging wall. A little bit of ultramophic in the, um, in the hanging wall of the Fitzroy fault. Thank God, now we know it's a thrust fault, but we didn't, if, if we didn't, otherwise the football and the hanging wall would be the same age and we'd be wondering what's going on. That fault does not trace into the Pangolo unconformity. So there's an unconformity down through here. Um, last year, Marion drilled a beautiful drill hole all the way out through here and went straight through that unconformity and it's as sharp as a knife. No deformation, no nothing. You know? so, um, so we're pretty confident about that. That's something else to keep in mind when you're mapping and you're logging, right? You can drill 100 holes through that and they can all be shear zones. But if the 101st one is a primary preserved unconformity, then that was an unconformity, okay? Even though, because the strain comes later, it can wipe out, do whatever it wants. But if you get a hole and you get a preserved, good quality field relationship, you can use it, okay? Um, okay, so in terms of uh, mineralization and ages, this is where Velvet and Canana Bell sit. This is where Red Hill White Feather sit through here, with a decent gap separated by um, the Pangolo unconformity. Now what you don't get from this is, uh, which you do get from this I should say, is the general imprecision of the shrimp method. And I'm going to get caned by the UWA for saying that, but uh, I can't help it. The, um, it's a high resolution technique, it's got a very, very tiny microprobe, you can put it on any part of the crystal you want, but the analytical precision is not good enough to see through the, the events that we're looking at here. So we've got things that are happening on the scale of a, a couple of million years, and we can't resolve them with the shrimp technique in these felsic rocks. In mafic, mafic rocks, it's much better. But um, so we've got to get the field relationships going. You know, that's, that's the key thing. Um, so the football rocks, the hanging wall rocks, and the canana bell porphyry are almost the same age within error, with, with the error bars, right? So KB porphyry ages through there. Football and hanging wall rocks, they're all overlapping in through there. So, so what do you do? Right. Okay. And then finally, the Golden Mile. Um, uh, okay, let's have a look at the element association. Early gold, greater than silver, tellurium, vanadium, lots of vanadium, <coughs> excuse me, mercury, and then uh, late stage Mount Charlotte veins. So the sulfidic, pyrite, telluride replacement loads, crustiform, carbonate, quartz veins, and breccia are buckled and foliated. And I showed you Louis' example of that. And I've got a couple of other examples in there that you saw. Um, those foliated loads, uh, folded loads, are cut by late stage um, extensional quartz carbonate taper veins, Mount Charlotte style veins, okay? So definitely two, two um, separate styles that nearly always turn up in the same place. Next time you go to the pit, you're gonna see a whole bunch of joints, surfaces, they're big shiny joint surfaces in the sun. They're all Charlotte veins that are cutting across at a high angle, just tramming straight through all of those northwest trending uh, Femiston loads that are in the pit. Uh, the Golden Mile started out probably something like this, an early stage D1 ramp anticline, if you like, a uh, thrust fault that allowed the older rocks to come up on top of the younger rocks with a little bit of a fold, uh, it got tilted up and refolded during F2. And that's the kind of setting that we, we had. If I take a little cross section now through here, this is the kind of setting that happened at around about 2660 when the Gigi Lake volcanics uh, formed. And so we've got intrusions in through the deposit that are cutting the youngest rocks in the deposit at 2672. These intrusions cut through that and have the same age and chemistry as the Gigi Lake formation volcanic rocks, intermediate and felsic volcanic rocks. So you can see that the architecture of the D1 structure is already here. Um, and at 2660, We've got all of these, this funnel shaped series of loads with uh, aluminum silicate alteration in through here. I'll show you a slide of that in a sec. And um, in the high level parts, just within, within the, not very far from the, the base of the unconformity uh, above it. We fold that during F2. These are F2 folds. Um, we don't see the Currawang unconformity at Femiston because here's the current erosion surface but we can infer its relationships because it's folded and foliated by this penetrative regional cleavage. Okay, so that's, a, that's something we can use. And then everything gets cut by Mount Charlotte style veins um, in, during D3, D4. Okay. Um, and so just in a, in a map scale view, this is uh, um, Jordan McDivitt's map from his PhD. Um, that Gigi Lake unconformity is 
coming down the side of the Golden Mile like this. Uh, okay, so the super pit's just here, and um, this is the... Um, Adelaide Fault? Is it, Jacinda? I can't remember. <laughs> the big one that, that seems to cut it off at the south. And, um, uh, and so in the, the deep drill holes that have been drilled through here, um, we can map out this uh, stratigraphy and see that it's there. Um, now, the Golden Mile style is epithermal. The Fimiston style, epithermal style, right? I should have some pretty strong inverted commas there. They're high level, they're brecciated, brecciated they're crustiform, but more rarely um, coliform and cryptocrystalline crypto quartz. You don't see it a lot, but you do see it, right? And that's low temperature quartz, okay? Um, and it's still preserved in a lot of places. Um, with some pretty interesting low, sulfide, low temperature sulfide minerals and, um, and some high sulfidation state minerals. So, so some pretty weird stuff at the Golden Mile that you don't really hear a lot about in the literature, and I'll show you why. Um, the other key thing you get all the way through here is this metamorphose, stratiform synvolcanic alteration. Today it's chlorite and paragonite, uh, chloritoid and paragonite. Um, Scott Halley thinks it was probably clay alteration mostly, you know, high level clay alteration. Uh, so something completely different to what we're expecting in Kandana style um, mesothermal brittle ductile shear zone hosted systems. So here's a really nice map. Um, this is the 1962 gold mines of Kalgoorlie outcrop map of the Golden Mile. So can you believe that these guys mapped the entire Golden Mile prior to all the dumps and all the rehab and all the fences and all that stuff? It's a fantastic map. And it's, uh, this doesn't even do it justice. It's super detailed. And, um, and when you go and zoom in on all those little spots, you see that all these yellow things now are things that were called otrolite and uh, speckled schist that um, were mapped. Every, every, little, every little hole, spoil, dump, whatever, has got a, some sort of description next to it. So I just put dots on those. Um, and here's a, cu a couple of drill holes that have been drilled by KCGM where they've got big flooding zones of this similar kind of alteration, mostly hanging around the southern part of the Golden Mile. <clears throat> okay. So I guess the thing to always remember is that when you're dealing with a, a place like the Eastern Goldfields, you're dealing with um, something that's been modified after it, it originally formed. So you, it's, it can be difficult, but we've got to try our best to look through that deformation, through that alteration, to f try and find what, um, what's there to be found, okay? So, so even though we see a fold here that's got this particular kind of geometry and this kind of structure, we really need to think about it in 3D, right? Um, so a guy called uh, C.G. Larkin back in 1912 um, did most of his work, and in fact most of the work of the early descriptions of um, the Golden Mile come from the Great Boulder Mine, which was just on this side of the Golden Mile Fault, and um, down to about 300 metres he started, well he, he did his PhD and he, he described the, the rocks and the minerals in detail. He's got a very, very detailed uh, mineralogy and um, that sort of thing was followed up by by Simpson and, um, and a bunch of, bunch of people who did petrography on the Golden Mile have confirmed what he saw. And, um, and so most of this is gone now, okay? Well, all of it's gone and in the super pit. But what he's documented is Rialgo, Orpiment, Stibnite, and Enagite, and these low temperature, te temperature minerals that are um, in there. So if I now take a little cross section through here, AB, and look that way, um, and this is, the, this is the leapfrog model. So the green, green is the Paringa basalt, the blue is the golden mile dolerite, and here is uh, TRGD1, and um, another one of the deep holes through there. And this is the area where, so we've now got this south plunging F2 anticline. Um, this is Larkham's area where he found all these low temperature, high level minerals. And here's the Gigi Lake unconformity as mapped in the drill core and in the, in the field. And um, this is the zone just below the unconformity of what's starting to look like stratiform synvolcanic alteration that's been metamorphosed. Okay. Uh, gold tellurides, enagite, tenatite, tetrahedrite, stibnite, orpiment, sphalerite, and hydrite. Very unusual mineral assemblies for an orogenic vein system. Yep. Okay. So 
uh, just a, a quick slide on um, the, the, those kinds of minerals and these, I guess the vanadium, I didn't really emphasize that, but um, the vanadium is really quite an important thing at uh, the Golden Mile, particularly in the green leader um, and um, predominantly in the Arroyo shit, but you, know, you see it all through the field, right? Um, as the people who work there well know. And um, it's, a, it's a vanadium rich muscovite and it's in many other places, it's an early stage gang mineral, typical of low temperature, you know, epithermal gold, silver tellurium deposits, right? Arroya, Jundi, Kanauna have all got it. Uh, they've all got epithermal style veins, associated vanadium mica, telluroids, uh, lots and lots of different telluroids, and, um, and locally high arsenic. And in all three camps, those phases of mineralization are overprinted by deformation. Right? Um, in younger terrains, so here's Porgera, right? Now I showed you a photo from Fimiston before, and I can't tell the difference between that photo and the photo from Fimiston, right? Gold and, and telluroids um, in through here. Um, the crustiform veins with all this green roscolite in here and beautiful arroyo shoot style mineralization through there. Um, it's really typical of these younger low sulfidation alkalic epithermal systems, which is why it comes up, you know, because we, when we work in these younger systems, you look at those rocks and you go, hey, pff, that looks like Fimiston, you know, and, um, uh, and we see them. Porgera um, in PNG, Cripple Creek in Colorado and, um, and Fiji. And, uh, and also we get quite a lot of um, evidence for anhydrite in all of these systems um, associated with the ore. Okay, so um, second last slide. Um, if I put all, all of those three examples together into a single table, Binduli, Kananabel, the Golden Mile, the two major unconformities, the Gigi Lake unconformity through here, and the Currawang unconformity, um, and the gold events in red, then, you know, I'm not going to go through detail, but you can see we've got these, excuse me, these earlier phases of uh, mineralization that are overprinted by the Currawang unconformity and, and then late stages of D3 and D4, shear zone hosted, fault hosted uh, gold deposits in through there like that. Um, I haven't found any good spots to, that, to date in the Currawang where I've got a, a gold vein, you know. But you can, you can find it in some of the older, slightly older black flag conglomerates, but not, um, but not in the Currawang. Whereas the example I showed you from um, Tanzania and from, um, and from Canada, where, where, you know, that, that uh, gold bearing stuff was in the, uh, in the Tamiskaming. Okay, so, um, uh, okay, like, I think that those are the, the a, a re -su summary of the main points. Um, there's a common history uh, of all of these gold belts um, throughout the productive, gold productive um, parts of the, um, of the neo archean and um, the, the major gold deposits include early synvolcanic and late stage orogenic components. The best deposits contain both. Okay? Um, we've got multiple generations of greenstone cycles and I, for me that's the most exciting part of the research that's happening right now. And um, we're because the more of that stuff we find around here, the better we're going to be able to map out that early architecture and, um, and get, a bit, get a bit closer to looking through all this crazy deformation that happened in D3. I mean, we still want the D3 deposits, right? They're perfectly good deposits. They're 100,000 ounces to a million ounces. Sometimes they're 3 million ounces. That's great. Everybody loves them, right? But we prefer 10, right? Yeah. So, um, so the association of early stage mineralization with unconformities <coughs> below the youngest volcanic sequences suggests that there's this, this early architecture that controls the structure that controls later mineralization as well, right? And um, so, so just to put that into a single sentence, world-class gold camps are located in areas of greenstone preservation, where we've got better greenstone preservation. Um, the major deposits are associated with the unconformities in those sequences, right? So for us as explorers and miners, that means we've got to get our maps in order, right? Everybody loves a new piece of tech, right? But a new piece of tech's no good if you don't know what the rocks are doing, you know? And that means having good, complete geological maps with dip and strike symbols, with a stratigraphic order, with structure. So you can say, I know that's an anticline, that's a syncline, this is a west dipping thrust fault in between. Th those sound like pretty mundane things, 
but they end up being the most important thing in terms of your understanding. And, th and then the next question to ask is, can I, can I make a cross section through that? And I don't mean with the slicer in Leapfrog, which is always fun, but you know, uh, can I build a, a reasonable cross section and say, this is what the structure of my gold deposit is doing? When you can do that, then you're in a really good shape to start applying um, all the fancy tech. Thanks very much.